Hello, this is the third episode of Ask an Analyst with Fabian and Sarah. Um, welcome. Hello. Hello. And uh, today's topic is a very interesting one, in my opinion. It's about our career and how to become an analyst and how to balance this with, well, your life. Um, so we will be starting with the easy questions first. <laughs> um, or maybe for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> College Code asks, are there any certifications that malware analysts must have? Um, no. Yeah, probably not. Like, some jobs do, like, require it, but um, I don't think it's in this, like, not everyone has to have it, and you can always find jobs where you don't need to have it. I mean, most of the people I know don't don't have them. Um, I personally don't even have a school degree, so there's that. And, and I'm not alone in that. Most people didn't visit college. Uh, most people, well, most people do have a school degree because they aren't idiots like I am. But um, <laughs> in general, in general, those certifications didn't exist like even even a couple of years ago. So nobody really requires them. And if you if you look through them, um, most of them pretty teach uh, well, teach pretty much really basic stuff, which is yeah kind of pointless and you can easily learn those yourself so yeah um i don't think the certifications um are required yeah same here so my m most of my colleagues don't have a certificate and certification <laughs> and some of them also don't have a degree of any kind so yeah um, another question from College Code: What kind of skills experience are employers mostly interested in when hiring a new malware analyst? So, Sarah, it kind of depends on what level you're going into. So, if you're going into like the most basic like malware analyst, you don't need that. Like, you just need experience compared to. It probably goes for like most of the job, but you just need experience with like knowing how to find out what malware does. And that's mostly what you'll be doing at like the lowest level in some companies. Um, for other companies, it might require you to do have like more, um, I guess, experience in like actually looking at the assembly and like reversing malware. So practicing that is always a good idea. Uh, Fabian, you are a CTO, so you you have kind of a say in uh, who might be a new employee for your company so yeah i do but to be honest i'm very how should i put in um i'm, I'm more interested in the problem solving and learning skills of people um compared to what they already know because if people are good problem solvers and easily pick up new stuff then you can always teach them in a relatively short time so those skills are way more important to me than someone who knows like every every single upcode in the Intel instruction uh, set, for example. Do people actually know that though? I I doubt it. I doubt it. But I mean, you, you don't really have to, right? All you need to do is how to read the Intel reference yeah, manual, I guess it's and more like then knowing... you can always look it up. I guess when you're talking about like reversing malware so like being able to reverse a sample you've never seen before like problem solving kind of thing yeah i guess that's what you mean in a way. yeah i also think that's more more an attitude than a skill so yeah it is it really is yeah definitely so also if you if you never ask for help or any questions in an interview with with you uh, with me then, then you're definitely doing it wrong because the questions in the interviews I do are usually designed for you not to know the answer because I want to know how, how you will react if you don't know anything. Oh, that sounds mean. <laughs> oh, it is, it is. But it kind of sets you up for the work environment where you should be comfortable with asking for help if you like need it. Yeah, of course, but if you're in an interview, you wouldn't ask for help, would you? I mean... 
<laughs> yeah, you should though. I mean, I, I mean, tell them to simply ask if they don't know anything, so I can I explain feel, it to yeah, them. So if like, they don't, then I thought it might be better to like try for a bit, and then if you really don't know, just say I don't know, rather than like sitting there just kind of feeling really awkward. Yeah, I guess that would be better. I mean, there are some people who who don't admit, but you just know that they are googling it right now. <laughs> so it's it's very interesting. Um, so yeah. I have an addition to make. Um, we at one point we got an application from someone who told us he writes malware, and this is really a no go. I don't know why why a lot of people think this is an advantage. Um, the problem this creates is that the AV industry also already has um, this reputation problem that some people think they create malware so uh, they can like secure you from that malware. Which is amazingly and, like dumb because there's plenty of malware out there. We don't need to write any more. Exactly. It's a, a little bit similar to the pharmacy industry. Like people are sick. There are there will never be the case that people are not sick and still people believe the pharmacy industry makes us sick. Um, I doubt that though. Um, so yeah, I would say even even if you at some point have written malware, I'm, I think it's it makes sense at some point if you write malware and just, just to test it for yourself and, and uh, see how it works and learn from it. But um, if you say to people that you did that, the um, em your employer will assume that you also tell this other people. So they have really a reputation problem if they if they take you for the job. So don't do that. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think you it could. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, you could say that you've done like a kind of proof of concept. I guess it's how you word it. Like saying malware kind of assumes that you've like kind of spread it or maybe used it on someone whereas if you say oh i made a proof of concept where i did this thing like i know someone made a like a ransomware in like macros for word documents and it doesn't have any files which is quite interesting but yeah you have to be careful about what you like say in terms of being like kind of a black hat as such yeah i agree i think it's also like just the wrong assumption that in order to be good malware analyst, the easiest way to do that is just to start writing malware. I mean, I don't see any trauma surgeons out there running around shooting people, so you don't have to do that to learn your well, well, the ropes of the job, really. So, uh, somewhat related to that question is uh, Kal. I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrong. Uh, Kalyan Kumar. Us, what are the top five topics beginner analysts must learn? So, what do you say, Fabian? Um, I think, like in, in in so many cases, it really depends. I mean, there are, there are malware analysts and, and research jobs out there that never have to do with any code because all this huge phishing and support scam ecosystem exists and you need completely different skills for those um, than when you actually um, reverse engineer ransomware, for example, or some actual malware. I think um, just, well, large exposure to malware in general is always helpful. Like if you um, know how to remove malware without just running a tool, for example, is quite helpful. Um, with that usually comes um, a good knowledge about like a Windows internal registry, all that um, stuff. It's always helpful if you know how to program. Um, preferable, uh, preferably in C or C++. But just if you if you know the the, the abstract constructs of uh, programming languages in some kind of scripting language, if it isn't necessarily JavaScript, then um, you're pretty well off as well. Mm, yeah, and then it really depends in what area you, you're going to work. If you want to work with Windows malware, then obviously you have to know the ropes of the um, PE executable format and all that stuff. If, if you want to do like Linux malware, then you obviously have to know ELF. So it, 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 it really depends. 
but most of the time, as long as you know like one programming language and know uh, about malware in general and uh, the operating system internals, then you are pretty well set, in my opinion. I also had uh, the basics about malware. I mean, I think that's kind of obvious. But, yeah. Um, sometimes people forget about that, that you, you have to be able to classify malware and to know how basic malware detection works and how, well, what uh, typical behaviors are and how you classify it based on that. So, all right. Uh, now there are more interesting questions, at least in my opinion, <laughs> um, about balancing. Balancing family learning and work or balancing university infosec learning and work. So um, I think, Sarah, you have probably something to say about the letter. Like the, That question is from Fernando, and he asked, how would you balance work full-time, university, and infosec learning? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's just like kind of dividing your time between what you have to do and like what else like so I work part-time um kind of um so I basically do it whenever I have like free time to so that gives me a bit more flexibility compared to having like a job where I have to work x amount of hours so that's quite nice which kind of comes with I guess the whole kind of job um but yeah I, I think just make sure you have like enough time to get through school and like revising and everything like that and also just making sure to not get overwhelmed so taking some time off just to relax as well is important um yeah um i personally i have also never worked full-time besides uh while i was studying at the university so i but i had a part-time job i was student assistant and I also had my son uh, by then, so I yeah I had a little baby, <laughs> and I was studying. So uh, my advice is that you can try to to kill birds two birds with one stone by combining the subjects that you can choose with infosec related stuff. For instance, if you have a project that you where you can choose the topic somewhat then do it, do something that you like, that, that's related to infosec, if that's what you like. And um, choose the subjects according to that. Then you might want to inform the pro professors of your situation. I really learned this the hard way because I knew one pro professor of mine who was very sensitive if students didn't show up to his courses. and. I had my son, and my son was in daycare, and the daycare closed at 4 p.m. So every course after 4 p.m. I couldn't attend. So, and for some reason I just assumed it would be okay. He wouldn't he wouldn't care so much because he would. I don't know. I just didn't tell him and uh, thought that would be okay. But it turned out when the aura exam came, he was came he was very upset about me and uh, I got bad grade because of that uh, he he actually said that to me so and at that point it's too late if you are already at the oral exam and tell your professor oh but I didn't come to your course because of that and because of that then he's not really open to that anymore so please tell that before if you have kind of a rough situation there um, so they understand it better and don't aren't angry about you. Um, yeah. Also, I used the time while I was traveling from home to university to learn in the tram. Um, I also think it's important that you don't expect to perform at your best level. If you are handling so many things at a time, you just can't be perfect. Don't expect this from yourself. It's making you crazy if you do. So uh, be lazy on less important things and don't feel bad about it. It's just the way it is. And concentrate on passing the exams, not on making them well. 
Um, also, try to understand that if you if you want to or if you get stuck in some some subject and you try to solve this on your own, it will be much more time consuming than getting help from somewhere. So don't be afraid to ask ask your professor or whatever, uh, ask other students, um, but don't be afraid to get help. And if it will be much uh, more effective if we do that. So and that's, yeah, that's my um, experience. Um, yeah, Fabian, you, do you have anything to add to that? Mm, not really, but that's mostly due to the fact that I have no idea how to balance my work and my real life. Um, I'm simply a workaholic, so I work all the time. So, so yeah, you you just that's don't a solution. It. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other question was, how do you balance family, learning, and work? So, which is what I'm doing now. Oh, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm kind of talking too much right now. I think. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um. So to answer that, uh. I'm not sure if I should give tips or if I should talk about myself at this point, but um, we divide the childcare evenly, my husband and me. We don't have any relatives nearby, so sadly um, there is some support missing, um, but it it still works. I mean, I love my work and I also do not have to separate this from to to stay insane uh, uh, to stay insane yeah of course to stay sane I don't have to separate the um, uh, work from my free time because I love it so much that I enjoy doing it I have fun doing it so I also do this in my free time and that's why I well don't get stressed out about it but if you feel stressed out from your work of course you should separate it more and um, what's also important for me personally is exercising because I feel much better about my body and about myself doing that. And um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really good for you. You have better concentration if you exercise. And, and, uh, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> now I talked so much. Is there anything you want to add about that? No, I don't think so. Just if you enjoy doing your work, don't like worry about like spending lots of time on it. Um, but if you feel stressed, like go and ask your boss or something. Be like, hey, I'm feeling a bit stressed at the moment. Just let them know. They'll probably be like okay with it generally. Just if you let them know. Yeah, letting people know is important always. So. No matter if the professor or the boss. <laughs> yeah, I mean, usually people people have been in the same situation as you before, so they usually tend to be very understanding. Yeah. Mr. Grimm asks, uh, what is something that noticeably improved your skills in this area? So, I guess in, in malware analysis. Um, Fabian? Um, honestly, I mean, I am kind of in autodidact so I learn by just doing things so just go to one of the many tutorial sites that post a lot of crack me's and then have a go at them I mean often they 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 come with um, solutions as well so after you crack the crack me you can look how other people did the crack me and maybe find more efficient or different ways, which is always helpful. So yeah, um, just go out and do lots of stuff pretty much and don't be afraid to not know anything. Just try it out. And Sarah? Um, I guess just like reading a lot of different articles and lots of different malware, because usually um, antivirus vendors and other like security researchers will put out um, kind of analysis um, blogs occasionally so they're really good to like read through and then you can see oh look that malware did that and that's interesting for me to know yeah i 
uh, when I started out on malware analysis, I had already my computer science degree, or almost done. And I think these foundations were, were a good prerequisite to, well, learn the other stuff very fast. So, um, yeah, I know how to do software development and I, I knew the basics in computer science, so that made it quite easy. Uh, and I th also think learning by doing is the best you can. It's it's a bit like learning how to drive a car. Uh, if you just read books, you will never learn it. So do it and start with it. Um, the JHEX asks, if you could go back when you first started out, what advice would you give to yourself? Um, Sarah? I mean, I don't really have a perspective on this because I'm just like, I'm quite young and I'm just starting out so I guess just like if you want to do something go for it just don't like hesitate I guess and just do it also don't wear a pumpkin costume for Halloween why that <laughs> oh it's a it's a cute story no it's not yeah it is now the question is do you want to tell the story there's not really a story behind it. It was just uh, one Halloween. I didn't have a costume, so my friend gave me this like pumpkin costume, and it looked really bad. In my opinion, <laughs> it looked very cute. But, cute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it was hindering your progress in starting out with meta analysis. Definitely. <laughs> I can't get over it to this day. <laughs> okay. Wow. Whenever she sees malware with a pumpkin icon, she just gets triggered and thrown back into those times. So that's why, why you were put off by the Trump ransomware, because it also looks kind of pumpkin-ish. Yeah, it, it's scary. It's just scary. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> now... What I would do, uh, to answer the question, what I would do, say to myself is please don't pursue a job or degree or education just because your parents want you to, because that's what I did at first. I was, I learned how to be a kindergarten teacher because my mother kind of wanted me to be there. And uh, she also gave me, well, the, the impression that I can't do anything related to math or computer science because I was uh, perceived as a girl so hmm it turned out that this was just a I mean I don't um, regret doing this uh, kindergarten stuff because I can now use it for my own son but uh, I still believe it was the right thing to change my path and just do what I like and do what I want and not do things because my parents want me to. They, Your parents don't know what's best for you. They don't. They just believe uh, what would have been best for them most of the time. Or they, be, they, they are afraid that you might not... That's very true. Yeah, that you might not get a job. They, they might be afraid. But really fear is, is not a good advisor. So do what you like. And you will be good at it if you like it. For me personally, I would just go back and tell myself, don't be an idiot, stay in school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so stereotypical. But why? Yes. Um, I mean, while the school degree isn't really important for my job, I would still like to have one. Um, yeah, so you don't feel... Um, how should I put it? So you don't feel... Um, kind of uh, mm, at a disadvantage, I would think. Plus, um, if you ever decide to um, actually go for a higher degree or like a college degree or university degree, then you will just have to redo all the school stuff again and that would be, yeah, pretty much a waste of time. It's like the only reason why I don't pursue a university degree is because I don't, well, I can't be bothered with going to evening school for like three years here in Germany to get my Abitur, so yeah. Yeah, it's harder to go back to school once you're already out there. Uh, 
I it's know not she that, to be honest. It's just like a huge time commitment. I mean, if if we had like the UK model or like the US model where you can just take take a test, um, then I would probably just do it. But here in Germany, it's a lot more complicated. Yeah, of course. Well, I I um when I made my how's it called the Abitur? <laughs> yeah. I mean, to, it's like a high school degree or the A yeah. levels in the UK. When yeah, when I did this, I I also did this after I had done the kindergarten apprenticeship. So, um, most of the people there already ha had jobs before they before they got their degree to be able to study, and they really said to me they have a lot of difficulties after being out of school for so long. They had difficulties to sit in school all the time and to be again in, in this position that there's an authority figure telling you what to do and so yeah it was kind of hard for some people to do that and go back to learning again so i can imagine it's difficult <laughs> um okay so now we i guess we can go to the next question now uh, Shalnak asks, what guidance and advice would you give to people who wish to pursue malware analysis and where would you want them to begin from? And related to that is uh, College Code's questions. Can a fresh college graduate get a job in the malware analysis field? And if so, do you have any tips you are willing to share? Um, Fabian. Um, yes, fresh. Uh college graduates can get a job in the malware analysis field although I don't necessarily believe that the reason for that is because they uh, have a college degree you probably would have gotten in without it as well um, yeah I think like the most basic problem solving skills are necessary like and the basic learning skills critical thinking skills um it's always helpful if you have like a little bit of background, if you got involved with like open source projects uh, that are related to um, malware, like um, for example, if you participated like in, in, in a honeypot project or if you participated like in something like Cuckoo, for example, um, or really any um, programming related stuff, especially if it's kind of security focused. Like maybe you contributed to Mozilla in some way or another, or maybe you reported some uh, vulnerability somewhere. Um, yeah, and last but not least, it's like just try to integrate yourself within the community. Um, that's always helpful. Um, one way you can do that, for example, is just to join a community like Leaping Computer and get some training malware removal so you ha know how uh, current malware infections look like. Um, or you can simply be very active on Twitter or try to simply seek out and find new compromised websites on the web that spread malware and report them and stuff like that. So yeah, those are like the, the three um, big things that um, will definitely help you get a job in malware analysis. Um, Sarah, you also got into this um, with flipping computer, right? Yep, that's pretty much true. So I met um, Fabian because of Bleeping Computer, and then eventually he offered me a part-time job. So that's kind of an example of how getting involved in the kind of um, Bleeping Computer, malware removal, and also getting involved in like ransomware helped me to get a job. Um, also, if you have like I guess kind of um, indication of like reversing malware so like for example if you wrote a blog post about a certain malware where you showed off some skills that's quite useful and also the whole twitter thing and just getting involved in the community is also quite great because they'll help you try usually help you try and get a job as well i also think that the project is like the best starting point you have some kind of project doesn't matter what it is um, like yeah you you named the examples um and you can yet you can then use your project to uh, to build connections 
Like, it's no use if you're on Twitter and you have nothing to show for. So... That's true. I think starting out on Twitter, if you have nothing, like... Not saying you have nothing, but, like, it's difficult to start out if you don't have something, like, to present to the community. Yeah. And that's why I'd, I would also say just just start a project and then share it and build your connections. And that's the best thing you can do. And the project will also show... Um, yeah? Yeah? No, you can you can continue. It's fine. I will just... My, my stuff later. <laughs> okay. The project can also show um, your future employer that you are motivated and interested in the topic. And I think that's more interesting to them than your degrees. So, Fabian? Um, yeah, pretty much. It, it, it kind of shows your employer that you know how to follow through and how to actually complete something, which to be honest, is quite difficult sometimes. Um, there's also an, a, another aspect. I mean, there's this idea in many people's head that there's something like the perfect software developer, right? Like the genius programmer that writes code that is so goddamn beautiful. You want to print it out and put it on your wall as some kind, kind of... And doesn't well, have any bugs. Yeah, it doesn't have any bug and bugs and it's just kind of a piece of art, right? Um, yeah. That's untrue. That person doesn't exist, or maybe it did exist, but I'm pretty sure that person died like two weeks ago. So it <laughs> or, doesn't or exist they wrote anymore. Some really simple software, I guess. Would be yeah. way to put it. Like if you write complicated software, you will find that it's a lot more difficult to make it like pretty, and you will find that you make bugs. Yeah. Um, but the the main thing is when you do a project, it's very important that you share that project because you you have to get into a habit of showing your code, not to be afraid that your code may be perceived as like stupid or silly terrible. or like terrible. Yeah, I know I used that word before and I still regret it. <laughs> um, anyway, um, just just get into a into a habit of doing this so you overcome like this uh this this fear of sharing your code early because it's important i mean you may think that you have like this perfect idea and you have this perfect implementation and if you shared your idea early someone could have pointed out you a better way to do stuff but if you disappear in a cave for like three months and well, hide away from humanity and just do your thing there. And then after three months, you show up and say, here I am and this is my project, look at it. And someone else goes, oh yeah, by the way, you could have done this way easier because there's this that exists and you could have just used that and saved yourself like like two months two months and three weeks. Then yeah, you, you feel pretty, pretty silly. And I get why people do it, right? Because you just think people will think that you're stupid when they see what kind of code you write. But the reality is everyone wrote horrible code at least once in their life, and everyone knows that. So, yeah, just, just get over yourself and share the code that you wrote around. Let other people read it and let, let them give you feedback so you can grow as a software developer. It's pretty important. I also think you can reframe criticism. Like most people think if they get criticized, they they are doing a bad thing. But actually, if someone criticizes you, they take their time to write you that. That means they care about your project and that it turns out good. And that means they see a potential in that. So please reframe that. Criticism is a good thing. It means people are interested. And it means you can grow. So it's a good thing. Um, yeah. Do you, well, do you want to add anything, Sarah? Um, yeah. I guess if someone tells you, gives you feedback, take that on board. Obviously, if it's not like your code sucks, then that's not very helpful from that person. And you can probably just, I guess, ignore that or like ask them, hey, what part sucks? And then learn from that. Like it's a learning experience. Take that take that chance i guess yeah also understand that you are not your code right you are a person you are a human being you have nothing to do with code if someone think that thinks that 
your code isn't very elegant or sucks, it doesn't mean that you as a person suck or that you as a person aren't elegant. Um, there, there's no no reason to get all defensive and just, oh my god, he just insulted me and stuff like that. No, they just criticized your code and that card has nothing to do with you as a person. So, the last question for today, or do we want to take in the security questions as well? Yeah, we can We can do the other ones as well, yeah. I guess. Yeah, okay. sure. Then it's not the last one, but it's the last one in uh, the career topic um, by Andrew. What was your biggest hurdle in your career, and how did you overcome it? So, Sarah? Um, since I'm like just starting out, I already have that much but I guess it's just making sure to like put yourself out there and not be worried about what people think about you and if you have something to share share it like you might think oh it's not that important but maybe other people like what you do and Fabian um for me it's yeah I'm I'm personally not not a very big like social butterfly that flies around and makes friends easily yeah and all we the... never would have guessed <laughs> yes yes i know i know because i have such a lovely personality right anyway um so yeah for me it was like just connecting to people which is very important because you all work together also if anyone finds a cure for imposter syndrome that would be pretty nice please contact me um that would be quite helpful and I know imposter syndrome is something that a lot of people struggle with, especially in the software area. So, yeah. Yeah, me too. It's like kind of, I think I think it's like a general problem. Like, yeah, it's just ah, imposter syndrome is horrible. It's just horrible. So how, how did you overcome that? Oh, I haven't. I like legitimately haven't. I guess you don't really overcome it, but necessarily, you, but you can change kind of how you think about it. I mean, that's just like a kind of hypothesis. I haven't really like tried that out, but I feel like if you change the way you think about what you do and like, I guess, ask people, hey, what do you think of what I do? What can I improve on? And what do you like about what I do? Then that can possibly help. Yeah, also just, just taking in the evidence, right? I mean, you can tell yourself, oh, I was just lucky that I found that and nobody else found that. And they looked for like over a week when debugging this problem that I just solved in five minutes. And you can just uh, put it off as luck and you can even put it off as luck when it happens twice or, or, or three times, right? But at a certain point, you just have to admit to yourself that oh, well, now it happened like 20 times in just one year. So maybe there's some kind of skill involved and it's just not luck. So, yeah, but it's but it's overall, it's kind of kind of interesting what kind of tricks your mind plays on yourself sometimes. Yeah, for me, it was also my own insecurity, even in starting out. I mean, we, we mentioned that already. Um, but at one point, I think even if you are afraid and even if you think you can't do it, you should just try. You will never know unless you try. And uh, that means, for you may instance, be surprised. Yeah, for instance, it means if you read a job application and there are requirements that you don't fulfill, please apply nevertheless, try it. Um, the people who write these job applications are often the marketing people who have no idea about it and maybe they didn't even ask a technical person what they need so they have expectations that are just not possible to fulfill and um, even if they are realistic you still might get the job as I did I got a job and I had no idea how to debug malware so why did they take me because I fit into the team and because I had the right attitude to I will I will learn this. I convince them that I will learn this stuff. Um, it may also mean that you pursue a degree, although other people think you can't, you you won't be able to to make it. Uh, try it, and it also means that you should do things that are difficult, and you should expect to fail. Failure is something that 
uh, pushes you forward. So if you fail, you should be happy that you learned something and just try again. You have, you know, in, in a lot of things that you do, analyzing Mave, you have endless tries to try again. And uh, that's what I think you should do, just try. So, do you have anything to add to that? Um, not really. Just, yeah, as you already said, most of the job. I mean, if if I set up like a job announcement, it's just m more more like a wish list than than a list of requirements. I mean, it would be perfect if you did this, but to be honest, if you can if you can convince me that you can pick those skills up in a reasonable amount of time, then I will still hire you if you have the right attitude, pretty much. Yeah, I think being like open to learning new things or being like yeah, open to learning new things and just kind of expanding on your skills is is like a really great thing. So, that's it with the career questions. Um there were I mean, if there were enough questions for this topic for security, I would have done another podcast with it, but it's only two, so we just take this in here. And um, Aura asks, is there something you would like to see from the InfoSec community in 2017? And, uh, yeah. Do you have anything you want to see, Sarah? That's a really difficult question. Um, I don't know, just... It, it kind of depends because the InfoSec security is such a wide, like, such a wide thing. I mean, you have kind of a twitter like sphere of you like your people um who you like connect with but there's so much like a bigger like community out there you might not even get to see so i guess just um expanding like into other groups would be quite good because then you get to see a different side that you might not have seen i mean that's not really what i would like to see but what you can do to like kind of see different things Fabian? Um, a couple of things, to be honest. I would prefer to see less next-gen bullshit, less uh, PR bullshit and politics. It's just horrible and it's annoying. Um, also, I would hope for a little bit more communication, to be honest, especially, I mean, there are a couple That's of... A good point. A couple of AV vendors out there now that do decryptors, right? But yeah. there's like legitimately no point in releasing your decryptor for the same ransomware family that has already been, already been broken like two or three weeks ago. Um, yeah. When you could have instead worked on a completely new ransomware family. And I kind of get why people do it. I mean, it may, may be awkward for um, like an a vast support engineer to recommend like an MC soft decryptor or vice versa. But the reality is uh, most uh, AV vendors um, aren't perfect. Well, pretty much no AV vendor is perfect and they all use some kind of tools that were written by third parties when dealing with customers that got infected um, at one point or another. So just get the fuck over it. I mean, personally, I wouldn't even mind to remove all the MZ soft branding from all the decryptors, to be honest, if it would mean that, well, Avast, for example, or Kaspersky would just use that tools and break other ransomware that hasn't been broken yet instead of I mean, just Kaspersky, rehashing the same. They usually tend to focus on different ransomware. Because... Yeah, they, they do that. Because we do talk with someone at Kaspersky, so we sometimes know what is happening before it actually happens with like their, them doing ransomware yeah just a simple twitter message or an email like oh by the way we are working on this one so i know and everyone else knows that there's no point in doing that they have that covered just focus on something else would be really really helpful so you basically you want that people work to more together so they don't yeah, pretty much, uh, yeah. do the work twice and I also believe that it's a good idea I think, I, I mean when I started out in uh, being a malware analyst I was already surprised that AV companies um, work so closely together like 
they share samples and yes they do they do that with with samples but they don't really do that with anything else yeah but i still was surprised about that though i i thought that well they would be like any other company just doing their thing without ever sharing anything but yeah and i th i think it's beneficial for everyone if if they work more closely together so i agree to that all right uh, another security related question and that's the last one for today uh, by Corey. if someone has no idea where to start on protecting their computer what steps should they take sarah um well i say first of all making sure you have all updates installed that's really important Unless, for example, your work requires you to have an outdated version of Java, there's no reason to have an outdated version of Java. It, or if you, if you don't use Java, uninstall it. Um, so that's probably the first step. And then I know some people would disagree, but installing an antivirus, if, you're, if you have no idea where to start on protecting your computer, chances are you might not be the most technical person. So having an antivirus just kind of, they're not perfect and sometimes they will fail. That's just the nature of like the work. But usually they'll protect against a lot of different threats, like um, especially pups, which sometimes um, even people in like the industry can get distracted and accidentally like install them. So it's quite useful to have that. And then free, I guess, would just be like keep an eye on security news because you'll find out about like new techniques for example recently there was a chrome font technique where they would like kind of hijack a website and make it look the text are called gibberish and then be like you need to install this font pack which was like an exe and then you ended up getting ransomware you fabian um to be honest, just don't read any technical advice online. Just just keep the defaults, which are pretty secure on Windows 10. Also use Windows 10, even if you don't like it. Just just use it. It's it's a lot better than all the Windows versions that came before. It's a lot more secure. And yes, you may be annoyed that Microsoft may want to install updates for you, and it may come at an inopportune time, but just do it anyway. I mean, it will be a much bigger, um, much bigger hassle and much bigger inconvenience for you to have all your files encrypted. So, yeah, just also on that note, make a backup and check your backup. Make yeah. multiple backups. Make make sure. Well, it's it's great that you do backups, but also make sure that you know how to restore your backups and make sure that you can actually restore them. Yeah, that's make sure pretty. you can actually restore them because in some cases they may have got uncorrupted, and I know that's happened to a couple of companies, and that really sucks because at least you made the effort to back up, but you didn't check them. And that's ju almost just as bad. Yeah, this is also important not, not only in regards to ransomware because um, even years ago when I had no idea about malware, when when there was a problem with the computer, what did I do? I just uh, reinstalled the operating system and got everything back from backups. And what also happened to me, what was the reason that I did backups, <laughs> was my um, my uh, hard disk drive just died from one hour to another without any indication that it would die. So it would just happen like like that. And uh, since then I had no trust anymore in in my hard drive. So I backed up things twice to two different devices. So I had it three times. And, uh, also, just, just one more thing, since it's going through the press at the moment again, and I'm pretty sure it will go through the press again and again because it's just cool and hip to do it. Nobody will blow a zero a zero day exploit to get your vacation pictures, people. I mean, it it it's not going to happen. I mean, if you do have material on your system that is so critical that um, maybe the NSA or the CIA or whoever would be interested in getting their hands on it, it's just so much easier to just grab you on the street and break a couple of your fingers to get the password um, and instead of just 
doing some kind of zero day on you. I mean, people don't 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 really realize that these zero day uh, zero days are just extremely expensive. Like we are talking hundreds of thousands of dollars here. And they simply won't do it for a large scale attack on home users to get some vacation pictures or to, to install some ransomware to maybe get a couple of bitcoins. It's just not going to happen. I fully agree to that. Also, a lot of people who talk about zero days don't know what it actually is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, you want to add anything? So. Um, yeah, I guess just like a lot of the people who talk about zero days tend to be browser vendors. Um, they don't necessarily have a perspective on like, what the average user is like. So fair enough if you're in a company and you have really sensitive data. I mean, you probably shouldn't be running Windows and I would have really good security. And obviously that would be a thing. But for the average home user, you don't have to like worry about that because it's not it's probably not going to happen it it makes great news and it it's good conversation um on that kind of thing but it's not the most realistic yeah it's a bit like securing your your door while you have a hole in the wall yeah i mean just fix uh first things first <laughs> Personally, I would also be interested since, since like Mozilla and I think Chrome as well said that antiviruses so greatly interfere with their security efforts. I would be interested if there's any research into that, like concrete evidence, which of the vulnerabilities that were found in their products and that was were abused by malware was made possible by antivirus software. Yeah, that's I mean, interesting. they they just say we 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 kind of stand in their way of securing their product. So, um, they must have some evidence that points this vulnerability could have been fixed if we didn't have to accommodate for a certain antivirus software. I'm just interested in that because at the moment it's just like a whole bunch of finger pointing, and I do agree that the antivirus uh, industry. Um, has to catch up in some aspects when it comes to exploit mitigation techniques. Um, but I don't necessarily think that someone... I mean, I know that people on Twitter can, can be kind of uh, hyperbolic sometimes, but if someone tells you, oh, I'm not going to tell you what to do better because you don't even do that, it, it just sounds, sounds childish to me. Like, do you even lift kind of thinking? Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's that's an interesting topic in itself with those. Uh, well, yeah, you could probably make a whole uh, podcast about talking about that. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. I, and I also, also invite some bra browser witness for that. That would be interesting. Yeah, I think it would be an interesting to have an actual conversation between some industry experts in both fields and to actually come together and have like a conversation about it. I think that would be interesting. Yeah, indeed. Okay, it was quite long and interesting, and uh, thank you for joining this FAQ. Um, so, yeah, I wish you a nice day, and um, see you again, I hope so. Yeah, hopefully. Thanks for having us. Yes, definitely. Thanks for having us, as Sarah just said. Great. <laughs> You're welcome, and thanks as well. And Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.